Welcome everybody to Science Session, so Quiet Science Session. We do these every now and then. We've got three this month, actually. This is our Science Session. There's a lot of alliteration of S's in the name of this, I realize, and that might be an issue for people with misophonia, but we're highlighting student researchers on misophonia this month. We've got two others later this month that I'll talk a little bit about, but this is with Mabel Ford and Freya Noonan. A couple of housekeeping things. Be sure to put questions in chat. There's an open chat window. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in there. I'll keep an eye on it. Uh, I think there's gonna be a lot of really interesting questions on this one. This is some, some really fascinating work that we're gonna be talking about. Let us know of any issues. If you have any technical issues or anything like that, if something that we're doing is is triggering in these kind of live events, it's, it's almost impossible, even though we all do our best to not do anything triggering. Let us know if there's something that we're doing that is that is an issue we'll try to cut that out there is transcription in this webinar platform next to the chat the public chat you'll see a little tab that says transcription and there's also live closed captioning available so if there is something triggering noise wise that we're doing we make this available so you can just mute us and you can read what we're talking about and and that makes it more accessible lastly this is being recorded so this event We'll have up on our website and our YouTube channel probably later today. And you can watch it for free there at any time you want. So Quiet, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. We're tax exempt. We're based here in St. Louis, Missouri in the US. We do a lot of things regarding misophonia research, including misophonia research grants. We grant up to $1,200 to graduate students to fund their research about misophonia or related conditions. You can see more about that at soquiet.org slash grants. And actually our guests today are the recipient of one of those grants. I'm excited to talk about that. It's really cool. We also have the Misophonia Research Pool. This is a centralized Misophonia Research Participant Registry. We get asked the question a lot, how do I participate in Misophonia Research? I wanna help advance the knowledge we have of this misunderstood condition. And it's an unusual disorder. There's a lot of interest in it. So this is a way that you can sign up to be notified of any upcoming studies that are happening and the researchers contact us when they need people. It's like a little matchmaking service that we do. It's all free. Also, the Misof International Misophonia Research Network. This is a think tank of some of the top misophonia researchers worldwide. Our guests today are members of that as well. And this is a way to open up new avenues of communication between people across the world from different fields who research misophonia. We'll have more about their activities later this year. All of our programs are free. Everything we do as an organization is free thanks to tax deductible donations. If you'd like to continue that and you're able to make a donation, you can do that on our website or you can text the word so quiet to 53555 and make a donation on your phone. Like I said, if you're in the US, it's a tax exempt donation. If you have any questions, comments or concerns about anything we do, you can email us at any time, hello so quiet.org. And lastly, I'd like to introduce our guests. Let me stop sharing this. Uh, all right, our guests today are Freya Noonan and Mabel Ford. Would you mind just briefly introducing yourselves and we'll dive into your work that, that we're talking about today? Yeah, sure. Um, so um, I have just finished my degree studying anthropology with innovation at the University of Bristol with Freya. Um, so we share our master's in innovation, which is basically business and entrepreneurship degree. Um, centered around design thinking and uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you, Freya. Yeah, so my name's Freya and like Mabel, um, I study innovation, but the subject I study with it is management. So my degree is very made up of kind of studying business um, and organizations, but with that kind of design and entrepreneurial side to it as well. Um, and I suffer with misophonia myself, so this is kind of where the project came from. Um, yeah, me and Mabel have been working on this project for the last sort of seven or eight months. Um, so there's quite a lot to talk about, um, and we're really excited to be here. I can't hear you, Chris. I don't know if Freya can. I was on mute. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> absent-mindedness. Um, I'll start out with a little bit of uh, a background of, of what the format here is going to be. This is just kind of a free-form conversation. I've read the paper that is not quite published, but is uh, nearing that point. And 
fill in a little bit about what the background is and then you can kind of take it from there. So I, I don't have a background in science. I say this often, my background is actually in the arts. I went to grad school for theater. And so before I even knew what this was about, this, this is what a typical misophonia research paper looks like. This is a common one. And uh, Freya and the Maples uh, project looks like this. So it's clearly very different and very creative. And we were excited to fund this because it's really thinking outside the box. So far, misophonia research has been in the clinical realm. So looking for possible treatments or what the mechanisms are that cause misophonia. And this is something really outside of that. This is legitimate research, of course, but from a whole different perspective, a whole different creative perspective, in my opinion. So with that started, you mentioned, uh, Freya, that you have misophonia. Can you all give us kind of the, the, the conversational elevator pitch of where this project happened and, and why it started and how you came to this point? Yeah, of course. So within Mabel and I's degrees, we're quite lucky that we have quite a free reign of what we want to look at and study and come up with ideas based around. And so back in September, when we started this academic year, our projects always essentially start by exploring a problem or kind of an issue that we see in the world. And one of the I, sort of ideas for a problem space for me was misophonia. Um, I've suffered with it for probably about 10 years now and kind of had only recently put a name to it. And so to me, it was such a big thing in my life that I never saw anything kind of in the real world that I could actually look at and relate to. So I saw this as quite um, sort of a big problem space and something that kind of needed further research, um, particularly from that human centered perspective. Um, and I think sort of Mabel had her kind of own reasons for joining the project, if you want to elaborate on that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I, um, I more lent towards, I guess, the methodology part of innovation, um, like throughout our degree. Um, and so I didn't have an individual um, entrepreneurship idea necessarily. So I wanted to start from scratch from somewhere. I didn't know what misophonia was. I didn't know anyone could have it. I. I had no clue that it, you know, even existed um, as an auditory problem. So that was perfect for me because I could start from a place of knowing nothing and eventually, I guess, become kind of an expert in human centered um, design within misophonia um, throughout that time. Um, I think from an anthropology perspective, I was interested in how it was a social um, socially ignited condition but it had such a strong individual um, reaction on people so that was quite a personal thing why I was so um, interested um, to start that project and see what we could do with it to improve lives in a social way um, you know aligning with kind of my values with anthropology and, and the future of what I wanted to do so yeah that's that's why I got involved with the project. Yeah thank you for that and when we're talking about this, this is really a coming at misophonia from a different angle than we've seen in, in any research so far, to my knowledge. The title of your paper includes the term human-centered, and it, it seems like that would make sense. But when we're talking about researching something, and, and your project went through multiple phases, there were some pivots and some realizations that you had that changed your work, and, and you adapted as you went along. So we'll get into those. But when we're talking about human-centered as opposed to traditional clinical research, what does that mean in, in your own words? Um, so human-centered, I think I would describe that as putting the emphasis on a systems approach as opposed to kind of a traditional scientific. It's still a scientific approach in the way that it's a rigorous kind of um, use of um, experimenting and design and methodologies and things like that. But you're focusing on kind of world views um, as really integral to how you understand the person and the things that are going on in their lives, um, if that if that works. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. Freya, would you agree that that's 
Yeah, definitely. I think the thing that we always come back to, and that I've already mentioned in human centred design, is talking about the problem and kind of falling in love with the problem, um, rather than maybe just looking at something for the sake of it. It's kind of taking these problems that we see in the real world and taking quite a pragmatic approach to understanding not only um, people within that project, but the things that sit around it in that system, like Mabel said. Gotcha. Your, your paper is laid out very nicely with different color coding for different chapters. And so I'll, I'm going to kind of go through those. But at, at the initial stage, when you decided that you wanted to focus on something that maybe even was unknown regarding misophonia, you narrowed in on what you're calling the silent sufferer as the key person that you wanted to work your innovations around. And how did you come to that? Uh, because there's a lot of different types of, of people that could have been, it could have been an innovation around furthering clinical research or something. Talk a little bit about more how you centered on this, the silent sufferer as, as the key person to focus on. So I think um, immediately we are taught to work from a user-centered perspective. So we wanted to identify who we were actually aiming to help and um, investigate properly. Um, and so that was very obvious that it was a person with misophonia um, and we didn't want to um, work around the subject. We wanted to understand as best as we could um, that specific individual and those types of personas. Um, so we would, um, I guess, scope kind of the research and see what kind of trends and what kinds of groups of people um, that we were finding were suffering with the condition. So if that was related to age, if that was um, kind of social standing, um, all those all those kind of demographics. And the silent sufferer came about because there were things that weren't quite understood in terms of we we learned that people weren't actually putting a name to misophonia so so for example through twitter threads and, and through reddit threads there was a lot of aggression and a lot of anger um surrounding reactions to sounds um certain triggering sounds but on a lot of these threads it was it was like groups of people finding they were doing the same things but they didn't know that there was a condition. They didn't know it was a name for it. It was just completely put into the ether. Um, and so using the term silent sufferer, it, I guess, encapsulated a lot of different things. It encapsulated the people who didn't realize they had the condition and so couldn't explain why they reacted so um, so emotionally to noises. Um, it also included people who knew that they had it, but they struggled to manage it. So they were still suffering with the condition. Um, and also there was that element of families and people close to people um, with misophonia who were also really struggling to, to help those that they really cared about with such, um, with such a distressing condition that um, was really taking over people's lives. So that's how we landed on the silent sufferer um, as our core, our core problem um, personas, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And, and within silent sufferers are people, like you said, who don't even know that there's a term for it, maybe kind of in the dark silent sufferers, like they just deal with this thing and don't know that there's a community and that there's research and there's a name. So what happened from there? You, you give a, a pretty thorough outline in your paper of, with a, a nice pyramid chart uh, <laughs> of what the process was of thinking through, OK, that silent surfer is the person we want to really wrap our research and our project around. What were the next steps of coming up with some hypotheses and some, uh, ex I guess, experiments? You call them sprints, but they're these active Set workshops, I guess, um, and you did a lot of background research. Uh, you did a meta-analysis on pretty much all of the research that's out there. Tell us, w walk us through going from that germinal idea to formulating, hey, this is our project. This is what we're going to do. Yeah, it was it was a a long journey. To be fair, I think we started off with that initial 
focus on the stakeholder of the silent sufferer and we were very conscious that it was a sensitive stakeholder and one that we couldn't just straight away go to and say oh how do you feel about this or how do you feel about that like we knew that there was going to have to be this kind of lead up to that so we we started just completely immersing ourselves in the research so we went to the misophonia conference we read loads of papers but we immersed ourselves in the sec uh, kind of more secondary research so uh, facebook pages and reddit threads perhaps kind of not such traditional research um, kind of sources uh, for traditional academic work and from there we we felt that we were equipped to start to approach the stakeholders and we did this through a methodology that we call cultural probes so the nice thing about a cultural probe research is instead of directly going to someone and asking them a question in you know an hour-long interview or something you tease the information out of them through a range of fun or interesting activities um, so one of the activities we did for example all credit to Mabel on this one was um, writing a breakup letter to one of your triggers and the responses we got were so rich in data because there were so many little things that you can pick out of those responses that teach you something perhaps more subconscious than the person even realises themselves. So it was kind of through practising these different research methods that we did actually realise that no one else was really doing what we were doing in terms of approaching the research from this more creative and human centred perspective. And that's kind of our first sort of period of research accumulated in this, that realisation of the lack of slightly different methodologies, which is where that meta-analysis came in. Um, do you want to talk about that, Mabel? Yeah, for sure. Um, so we, as Freya said, so we had this inkling and understanding. We tried to find other human-centred approach and more interesting design. Uh, outcomes um, as well as experiments that were going on and we just hit a wall there was nothing exciting there was nothing fun that was engaging that creative side of people's um, brains but we knew that we were so we could only go so far with our research so we just wanted to make sure that this kind of hypothesis was true so what we did is we went through um 166 if my memory serves me correctly um papers um from 2012 using um web of science and scopus online um varying from psychology to uh, neuroscience um anything we could find that included the word misophonia in the title that was a paper central and essentially talking about um misophonia research and we basically ran an analysis to see whether social solutions were being offered um, and then secondarily if um, social, um, socially based or environmentally based methodologies were being used to um, get these from people. So we were looking at things like qualitative um, analysis as well as quantitative ones and um, where these papers were taking place um, and again if anything interesting was coming up through looking through everything that we could possibly find we basically found that there were individualistic solutions so what we kind of uh, would describe as therapies so things like cbt emerging um more um brain scans and those kinds of things would come under quantitative analysis. But in terms of qualitative um, work, there's far less. Um, and so the environmental and social solutions, so things that would alter people's worlds to help them, as opposed to how the individual could adapt to the world that they found themselves in. This is that kind of dichotomy between adjusting to and something adjusting to the individual um there was a severe lack um in those environmental solutions there was about six papers um that came up with those and so those ba that basically confirmed our thoughts and findings that um that side of 
a design approach was missing from the research. And so we thought that we were well equipped after, you know, doing our um, innovation work um, on our master's degree that we could provide something that could fill that gap. Gotcha. So there's a there's a big gap in the existing research. I'm, I'm kind of going off of your timeline as our as our timeline talking. Before you got to that, it was sort of led by a few other things that you did. So idea mapping and one of the, the early ideas you had that you actually undertook involved live theater. Can you tell us a little, little bit about that sound mapping that you did, what some of those realizations were, and then we'll, we'll move on to proving the gap, which you were just talking about. There's a gap, there's a gap in the research. Yeah. Um, so Freya actually, um, basically we had a, um, a university theatre production and Freya watched the production and basically created an auditory map of when triggering noises and when different volume levels were going up and produced that as a, um, as a printout and we actually have a version I don't know if you're able to pull it up Freya I'll have it look whilst you're speaking um, so that was a rapid prototype idea that basically we wanted to give out to people um, before they went into the theatre space um, and get some really quick fire, immediate reactions um, from that and some feedback about if they'd ever seen anything like this before, if that could be helpful um, for people who were um who had other conditions or maybe they were neurodiverse and struggled with um, certain landscapes in um, to do with noises generally um, especially in spaces like theatres we thought that it was quite a exciting realm to be in because it is such a sensory space um, we thought how could we just add another addition to that as opposed to subtracting things away, we wanted to input something that could help if that, I know it's a really subtle difference, but it kind of, it, it was really important to us in our values that we weren't um, reducing an experience, we were just adding things to help improve it. Um, so yeah, this is the sonic map that Freya created. And so this was literally done, this didn't take, this was like within hours and then we just did it the same week. Um, so it was, yeah, rapid prototype in the very literal sense. Absolutely. And this was handed out to patrons of the plays to see how they reacted? Yeah, so it was given to, so production um, took the maps and they also were probably the most supportive in terms of inputting this uh, like this kind of thing within future plays it, it was also a key to kind of for them to express to us that they had uh, they also suffered with things like this and they kind of would discuss how that was working in theatre spaces and working within performing arts so even by doing it we're already opening conversations in that way um, and then yes we would give it out to people who were visiting the show um, it was we got positive reactions, we got negative reactions. It was, you know, it's a, it's a black and white piece of paper. When you're watching it in the dark, it's quite difficult. So immediately we're thinking, okay, it could be something that lights up, then how would that distract people? Or could it be something on your phone? Or could it be something that you only use in the interval, et cetera, et cetera. So this was, it really was something that we could just kind of gauge reactions um, more so than have a pro, uh, like a perfect um, solution to, to solving um, problems that people with misophonia might have in those specific spaces. It's pretty fascinating. This, even though this was an early concept, it kind of led to a lot of other things later that are different from this. This, this could be useful for anybody with hyperacusis or just who doesn't like loud sounds or anything. Um, so, after doing that, you didn't necessarily abandon this idea, but you realized it was a very early rushed idea that you decided to try out. You came up with that gap in the research. There's a lot of gaps in the research, and, and some of that is being talked about in the chat right now. But from that standpoint, when you found that there was not a human-centered, more social framework being researched, what was the next step? 
uh, I know you, there was a, a bit of a pivot that you had. And uh, I like to quote, raising awareness was not a useful objective. Broadcasting the condition perpetuated the opinion that misophonia was a weakness that needed fixing. And that was something that you wanted to avoid altogether. So all of this early brainstorming and, and some uh, fast experiments to get up and running led to kind of the big realization of what this project was going to be. Can you tell us a little bit about how that came about? Yeah, I think one of the things that struck us when we were doing the sonic map was we we definitely felt like we'd unearthed something here. You know, we were having really positive reactions, people suddenly feeling really seen by it. And it would have been quite easy for us to at that point have just said, OK, you know, we're just going to spend the rest of the year creating more sonic maps and just getting them to uh, improving them more and more. But it just to us, it felt like we were kind of putting a plaster on a bigger problem and it didn't feel that that one small contribution, whilst it could make a huge impact in that particular context, was not going to have a wide reaching impact. So from there, we, of course, did the meta analysis and we, we just sort of came to this realisation that the we didn't know if doing these kind of incremental smaller solutions was the right thing right now. Uh, we thought that there needed to be more of an infrastructure for people to develop these solutions from because putting one thing out there is great, but unless it has the correct kind of context and understanding behind it, it could actually be quite damaging if it's not delivered in an appropriate and sensitive way. So we really kind of took this step back and thought, how can we tackle this from the ground up? Because we were so aware of the sensitivity of the condition and throughout our research, we we noticed a lot that um, sometimes triggers could be quite almost transferable between people, something that someone might find particularly triggering when they bring it up. Someone else is like, oh, you know what? That is really annoying. And we kind of just felt that we really wanted to approach this from the ground up and really be careful about this awareness, not jump to kind of forcing our solutions down people's throat, kind of really developing a sensitive way of doing this. Right, absolutely. Um, Go ahead. I would, I would also say just in the participatory workshop um, that we ran that, that probably became so clear when we were bringing together people who had, yeah, never met anybody else with misophonia before and seeing that reaction saying, I also, you know, get triggered by, so if, even if it was a like kinesthetic trigger that um, we hadn't really touched that much on in earlier uh, primary and secondary research. And then to find that those relationships and even just those conversations they did become really pivotal, but they were only enabled by doing human-centered um, research through that specific methodology. So, yeah. That's absolutely correct. And it's something we, we try to be careful of when you're talking about the, the communicability of misophonia. Um, and you mentioned that a little bit in the paper, and then we'll go into your workshops and, and the brainstorming involved in that. But you mentioned a little bit that there was an issue understandably, I think we all have that, that Freya encountered, which is we're very focused on misophonia because we want to figure it out and live with it. But then we end up being very focused on misophonia and it seems to exacerbate it sometimes because that's the thing that we're paying the most attention to. You had a little bit of an experience with that and, and I know you made some, some concessions to, to accommodate for that. How did that come up? And then we'll lead into the brainstorming that you all did that led to your workshop. Yeah, I think it's definitely such an important point to bring up is the impact on the researcher. It's something that we don't tend to talk about, um, but being someone that suffers with misophonia, studying it can actually be quite damaging. And me and Mabel had a lot of quite frank conversations where I just had to be honest about how I felt. And we were very lucky that we were in a team where we were Mabel was very supportive of me and we had our own ways of working through it. For example, for us, humour worked really well. Mabel kind of 
became acquainted with my triggers over the course of the project. So, you know, she had permission from me to kind of make fun of me. And that actually really helped me to get through it personally. Might not work for everyone, but for me, that was a really good way of getting through it. But it was, that was actually quite a big part of the project was realising that it's not as straightforward as, you know, let's just go and do a bunch of research and kind of hope for the best. It's like, there's a lot of kind of hidden things behind all of that. And this is why we kind of, I mean, there's a lot to talk about in terms of the course of our project and all the different things we did. But in the end, we did kind of take a more kind of, we wanted to provide something which would help people to investigate these conditions in a sensitive way. And that was all learned from our process and from our own kind of personal experiences. Mabel, do you want to add? Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, I was just going to add to that, um, that even though that pivot happened quite early on in the process, um, as Freya says, with, with this research coming at such an early stage, we saw a really nice opportunity to instead of so as you mentioned before you said you know we could have stopped at a product or a service for misophonia we were really conscious of where all the research was leading to at the moment and decided that we could actually have a real influence and use that pivot for other people so it wouldn't have to people wouldn't have to go through those things again because for a researcher they are really important it affects your you know your general life it's not just a, a small comment there it's um it's a really personal and emotional thing and so we had an opportunity to create a toolkit that we you know we wanted to do and we wanted to involve ethics into it we wanted to involve um, consent and actually incorporate the researcher the person suffering um, and that that middle gap and whoever might fit um on either side of the spectrum and so that's I think one of the most important thing in important findings sorry of of the whole project um, and something that affected us so personally. Yes and I was really struck you found a, a resource that was very congruent to the work you want to do in, a, in an ethics toolkit that wasn't necessarily misophonia related but you found this and you contacted the the author of this ethics toolkit and, and talked to uh, this person about what it included and how you wanted to model your work ideally on that. How did that come about? And and then we can lead into your stakeholder, uh, your participatory uh, workshops and how those came around. Freya, are you happy to? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so essentially we knew that we wanted to create a, research, uh, a resource such as a toolkit and in the way that we kind of do with a more kind of design focused degree you do your market research you look into you know what's out there what's similar and it was just through that that we came across that particular resource um ethics kit by phil hesker and it was as simple as we reached out to him via linkedin just said would you be open to having a conversation with us and it was just such a positive conversation he was aware of the condition himself which was great and um we just had a really positive conversation about just just the general need for these kind of sensitive measures in research and um, not just you know plowing ahead but really actually taking the time to ensure that your participants in research have um, kind of appropriate sort of uh, routes to uh, support and people yeah. around them who they can go to. I think also he really reassured for us that it would be a um, valid and, and valuable output. Um, he's kind of uh, made part of his career from doing that um, toolkit about consent and ethics um, quite a few years ago, but it's really um, grown for him. So that was really encouraging for us that we could have a real world impact or continue to to make something tangible and doing something creative and having a book or a website or or some um, form of visual tool that people could use um, is something that me and Freya wanted to do from the beginning of the project anyway so it felt very aligned in that way 
Excellent. Out of that came your workshop, which was uh, a particip participatory workshop with a bunch of different ideas that uh, you all brainstormed up through sort of an agile project management system, if, if that's the right term, which used a lot in like software development. Can you walk us through a little bit about that coming up with what you were going to do in this workshop, conducting the workshop, and then your takeaways from this participatory event? Yeah, for sure. So um, we originally thought that we wanted to do a co-creation workshop. So we spoke to some um, co-creation experts about how best to run something where we were taking people who were suffering con the condition with the condition, sorry, and put them in the same room and the types of activities we could do. Over the years, when we're working for clients or on our own projects, we were used to running wacky or uh, more unusual experiments. So we like people getting up, we like people writing, we like people drawing, we like people taking pictures, people finding things, discussions, worst ideas, best ideas, anything that's stimulating um, conversations and forging connections between subjects and disciplines. We were aware that people would be coming from kind of different worlds. And so um, how, how to use everybody's skills to the best advantage within that. Um, we wanted to recruit um, people with misophonia specifically because we felt that those were the voices that we wanted to make louder, I guess. Um, and so, we recruited, um, we had, so we put recruitment posters around our university and um, parts of our city. We actually got, um, we were oversubscribed for our, um, uh, for our participatory workshop, which was really a rewarding thing for us and um, that people wanted to get involved with that and obviously um, receive the grant. Um, that would give people an incentive to join for um, the few hours that we were going to be um, spending with them. So we are super grateful for that. So another thank you for that. Um, and and then it came to the day of, um, well, we were planning which activities and then we were, um, we actually carried it out. I personally, it was one of my favourite parts of the whole of the whole thing I just loved number one the value in seeing people coming together in the same room also the I would say that kindness would you say that's fair fair um from people that the I guess the consideration that they showed to people um in the same room and the value that they put on their ideas and the things that they personally struggled with and sharing um, what helped them. I've already mentioned before um, about um, finding out about the kinesthetic um, triggers that really hadn't come up that much in the research. Um, another kind of unique thing we found was about day versus nighttime triggers, which is something that um, I hadn't come across and we hadn't come across in literature, the difference in sounds um, at different parts of the day and where that might go um, yeah <laughs> what um Freya there was so much that happened it was almost a whirlwind of doing yeah. this workshop but we're so um yeah grateful to be able to have actually done it yeah I think because we really tra challenged um the kind of participants to think differently to how they might be used to because we have this human-centered methodology that we're so used to practice practicing like we've been doing it for years so it was actually quite a big challenge to get people to embrace that kind of methodology and you know it's okay to go crazy it's okay to like say something stupid like it's a completely safe and fun environment but people really did just take it in their stride and you know I think people felt real genuine connections with the people in the room because not only we had people who turned up who hadn't been able to put a name to what they suffered with until they saw our recruitment posters. And that for us was just such an incredibly positive thing that they could could basically put a name to something they'd suffer with and fast track that to being in a group of people 
who also understood it. And yeah, just just the interactions between people was incredible. And yeah, certainly not something we'll forget in a hurry. Awesome. And out of that came the toolkit, uh, which is something you're still working on and that you're looking for how to distribute it, I guess, uh, in an equitable way, something we'd be happy to help with. And a lot of people in the misophonia community would be happy to help with. Tell us after that workshop and some of the more brainstorming and the realizations you had from that, how did we arrive at this toolkit and, and what is its life going to be? So it's worth mentioning that through that workshop alone, um, people were generating over 200 solutions on and ideas for misophonia just in a, in a couple of hours. And, you know, from after that, that finished, we decided to um, spend some time seeing where some of those solutions could go. We voted on the best ones with them and then went through our own um, desirability, viability, feasibility tests between myself and Freya. Um, but I think the reason why we wanted to do that toolkit is we thought it was, you know, it was hard work to create it and to put it on and to, to make it happen. But there was no reason why that couldn't be replicated again. And, um, you know, even a different type of version of that, whether it is more co-creation, maybe, you know, uh, more self-directed. There was no reason that that couldn't be done on a bigger scale and um, by other researchers. And so the toolkit was a way for us to describe our approach, how it could be done by other people according to what they need, whether that's a business who is looking to um, improve the way that they approach people with novel conditions, whether that's academics who wanted to take a different perspective in how they approach they are, uh, their um, uh, users and their um, interloc interlocutors, sorry, and participants. Um, and so the toolkit was a really complete way that we could put that together. So yeah, it's on the screen here. It's a it's a book version as well as a website version. We will upload the link to the website. It is a bit of a working progress, but it works quite well on a computer. Freya's um, super good at that, and she's been working hard on that. Um, and we're also hoping to make that book. We have copies ourselves, but ideally to do that on a um, on a free basis we would just want to cover the costs of that and to cover the printing and the delivery um, it's not something we're aiming to make a profit off of because we've received so much generosity from the misophonia community um, we feel it's come full circle and that's what we've created from everybody else's help so um, that's that's why we have that position with it but yeah, this is aimed at businesses, it's aimed at academics, it's aimed at people um, interested in a different um, thinking and design approach towards the condition. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I, you all do, did get a what we call a conduction grant to do the workshop. We also have what we call dissemination grants, which is for the distribution of the final work. So maybe that's something we can talk about offline to help distribute the toolkit uh, in a way that you think is is appropriate. Thank you so much for this. I wanted to wrap up just by how it got my wheels turning. Nothing like this exists yet in the misophonia world as far as research goes. And one of the things that we hear a lot and which I think about a lot is research kind of seems to be, the clinical research seems to be a top-down thing and it's a little uh, distant. Uh, it's very analytical. So you have these academics kind of all looking at a bunch of misophones and seeing what they do. And, and it, the communication oftentimes doesn't go the other direction. They don't, you know, and that's how science works, I guess. But there's a lot of frustration, I think, where the people who actually have misophonia should be speaking to what they need and what they would like to see researched and, and how they get through. And one of the unfortunate uh, things that we also hear is all of this clinical research that's happening is all well and good. It's it's fascinating to see those brain scans and to learn what's going on. But how does that help me get through my day as somebody with misophonia? How does that help me get through my classes? How how does how can I put this into practical effect? 
to, to get through <laughs> life. And those answers aren't really there. And so your sort of lateral thinking coming at this is a breath of fresh air and is a really fascinating. We've had a few questions. And the first one is actually sort of along those lines. This is from Mary Petrie. And uh, I'll, I'll just read what she says. Um, she says, I know that you're thinking in terms of design approach. So coming at this from a different place than I am, but I've been struck by the fact that misophonia research isolates the person with misophonia as the subject or object of study isolated from the rest of the world. And what's left behind are the relationships the person with misophonia has with the outside world, everything. It's super frustrating to see the focus of research to be refining a definition of pathology, something else we could talk about, without any real solutions for interacting with the world from objects to people. So good for you. Where can we read your paper, which I guess is this, and also your toolkit, which you just posted a link to. Yeah, the link to the um, kind of report paper is also on that link as well. And yeah, we're going to keep it updated with any kind of additional resources. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for that comment. That's really, really kind and so nice to see that people um, align with what we also believe. And yeah, absolutely. It's completely where our project came from and the idea of there just not really being anything real or tangible and just the fact that as someone potentially just suffering with this condition an academic paper is not necessarily what you want to be reading you want something that's a bit more accessible that's just going to help you seem feel seen uh, so yeah it's it's all exactly where our project came from so thank you for that awesome uh, another question, do either of you plan to continue researching uh, misophonia now or after you've graduated? What's next? I personally, as we said right at the beginning, um, that idea of falling in love with the problem, um, I really have fallen in love with this problem. Um, and I think it is such, such a preliminary stage for research. It's, it's made me more interested, I guess, in conditions and how we um, recreate spaces, environments, places, all these types of things um, for people with novel conditions. Um, and if that is specific to misophonia, I'm, I'd be definitely up for that. I'm still working out, you know, my own place after university of how I can you know, follow those and, and continue with those values. But it is something I I've definitely would like to do and have, have thought um, a decent, you know, bit about. Yeah. Yeah, I'd also agree. I think, I think we both feel like what we have done has been so valuable in such a short period of time. And it, it really would be amazing to carry it on to just you know, like I said, we've only just scratched the surface, like there's so much more that we can do just off the back of this sort of eight month project. So yeah, I think definitely would love to continue it. Just unsure of how we would necessarily go about that at the moment. We might have to make our own way of, of doing that. <laughs> Well, there's so much need for that, just in my opinion. And I talk to a lot of people with misophonia all the time, and I, I hear some of the same things again and again. And, and your work is addressing a big part of that. And, you know, this is purely speculation, but there there is some maybe perception that misophonia isn't really a disorder. I know in the consensus definition, it's described as a disorder, but it might be a trait. It's just a natural variance in the population that could even have like an evolutionary basis. And so we know based off of the, a study that was done in the UK, which you cite, um, the Dr. Gregory and Dr. Uh, Vittorito had done, that as one in five people have clinically measurable symptoms of misophonia. And so this is a much more prevalent thing than we thought even a few years ago. And addressing the social aspects of it, accommodating for it, understanding it is such a breath of fresh air. I know I've used that term a couple of times, but it's it's innovative and coming at this from a completely new direction. And for that, I, I as somebody with misophonia, thank you for these outside of the box, lateral thinking ways uh, that you've put together in this project. It's really, really enlightening and, and validating. 
Thank you. In my opinion. Thank you. We really appreciate you saying that. <laughs> sure. um, I'll definitely uh, keep everybody up to date. They can follow your website. But as the project continues, because there's still work to be done on the toolkit and updating it and keeping it fresh and, and unleashing it. You know, our organization and a lot of the people you've spoken with, uh, Zach and some of the other folks you've spoken with, I know are really on board and are big fans of your work and, and really delighted and excited to see this, this view of things. Uh, w when you first applied for the grant, I compared it to the Fringe Theater of Research. And I meant that as a high compliment because this, yeah. is, <laughs> this is a big experiment um, to see, you know, it's not a traditional production of Hamlet. We're doing something completely different just to see if it works and see what comes out of it as, as an experiment and really analyzing it um, from a data perspective and a, a human impact perspective as well. So that's really enlightening. I, if you were a fan of this, for people out there, uh, our, our next guest, uh, next time we do a science session in a couple of weeks, is, is in a similar vein, really gets my wheels turning outside of that clinical realm, uh, a guy named Dan Holohan, who is in the social work field. So it's a kind of an extension of this idea, and it's about misophonia in, in social work, and it's very congruent to the similar things that we talked about here. Are there any final questions? Um, okay, here's here's one uh, as a person who heard about this project earlier on and then able to see the product on my own screen, I'm very appreciative of your contributions to the field, as am I. In my work with hundreds of MISO clients, I have many research topics that occur to me. You've addressed a few. Personally, I see... Oh, this is Dr. Jaffe. Uh, uh, personally, see misophonia as a neurodivergence. Absolutely not a disorder that can be approached from a strength space. That's from Dr. Jaffe, who you also consulted with in this paper. Um, so I'm glad that she's here. Yes, thank you for that comment. Um, yeah, Dr. Jeff was great. And um, yeah, I think that last kind of sentence about it being kind of a part of neurodivergence, not a disorder, is is definitely something we are, we believe in a lot. And we yeah, feel we'll that, about. yeah, we feel like any solutions or things that come up to help people with misophonia should only be things that kind of improve the world for everyone like there's no kind of detracting from anyone here it can only be seen as you know something yeah like you say a strength base definitely I think to add to that that kind of encapsulates the values that we have that you know have taken over this whole idea that you know from from the perspective of the individual but also I guess what we now want to do is encourage the idea that those different perspectives, which might even incorporate, you know, methodologies that people use, the worldviews that people have, are as valuable as a more traditional scientific approach. They're just simply different, but they are, are no less important or valuable than anybody else's. I think that kind of is a nice um, link and full circle that makes sense in my head anyway. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of that neurodivergence um, viewpoint and, and advocacy has been done in the autism community and the ADH community and many others. And uh, Dr. Gregory, I'm not sure if you got a chance to talk to Dr. Uh, Jane Gregory, but she has a book coming out later on this year that talks about people with misophonia as super guards. And uh, what she means by that is in meerkat colonies, there are specific meerkats that have a heightened sense of awareness and a much higher sense of hearing and everything. And they're the super guards for the colony. So they look out for predators and other threats for the survival of the colony. And she equates that in a way to people with misophonia. And so I think there's a lot that we still have to learn. And it's been fascinating over the last few days to see the viewpoint and the theories and the general consensus of what misophonia is and all of its complexities. And so your work here has been really, a, in my opinion, a, a major step in looking at it differently than we have before uh, in, in a publication and research. So thank you for that. Any other final questions before we wrap up? This, it means the world to me that uh, you, know, you all came on and, and have been doing this kind of work and we're looking forward to seeing your work in the future and um, please keep us up to date on new things that come out of it. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting us. And thank you to everyone. For coming. All right. Thanks so much. We can go ahead and wrap <laughs> up. Thanks, everybody, for being here. I really appreciate everybody who attended and all the great questions. And hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.